Welcome to the Earth Feels Podcast. I'm Rose. And I'm Christine. Welcome to Earth Feels, the podcast for people feeling overwhelmed by the endlessly gloomy climate news. Where every week we have soul-based conversations about climate change and explore the idea that climate change may be happening for us as much as it is happening to us. If you are ready to shift your focus and secure the future for our kids and our grandkids, then this is the podcast for you. And yes, we do know how to spell. (laughs) Hi, Rose. Hey, Christine. You came up with our topic, so... So, so I've been really listening, you know, really listening and going back to the whole premise of when we started this podcast is climate change happening for us or just to us. And as I'm listening, I, I'm, I'm feeling the universe is really asking us to step into our purpose, you know, and, and um, how is it, how is this challenge This challenge is actually giving us the opportunity to step into our best selves. So how is climate change asking us, asking us to change? Um, How is climate change asking us to change? How is it, you know, it's, it's like, so we're in this space now that we know, I mean, scientists have proven it. It's, there's still going to be climate deniers and there's people that, for whatever reason, the profit motive, they don't want to change the way things are going. But every day we're being hit with this onslaught of what's happening. The planet is changing. The sea level Bush fires, floods. floods. But yeah, exactly. Look at, look at what's going on with Sydney, right? It like the pictures are horrific. It, they were, it was on fire and now everything's underwater. It, it's, it's like crazy making. Okay. So we know you have to know on some level, whether it's, whether, even if you're in denial in your head about how bad it is, you, your body knows what's happening. Okay. Well, and you remember uh, Dr. Lisa Van Susteren, who's the psychiatrist who's, who coined the term pre-traumatic stress syndrome for- um, Pre-traumatic stress syndrome. Yes, for climate change. And I remember in a conversation with her, she said to me, the deni- climate deniers are, the most scared of everyone Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because they can't even process the enormity of what's going on. So that is, so, so, so can we talk about our response to the knowing? Can we talk about the, our response to the knowing? And so there is an initial response of fear, right? Yep. And Um, sometimes it's not just initial ongoing. Right, right. And then, and I was thinking last night too, you know, about the whole Elizabeth Kubler Ross um, death and dying, right? The different levels of um, denial and uh, anger and bargaining and bargaining and, you know, despair. Right. Until we, until we get to acceptance, Mm -hmm. right? We, we get to acceptance. So, but, but all of that, if you believe in in our spiritual selves that we are here for this time we are made for this time we've been called to come for this time we all come in with our own gifts and this time is asking us to access those gifts in a way that we never have had to before maybe in a way that we've been preparing our entire lives for and that can be through activism. I'm definitely an old hippie, um, you know, question authority. That's always been my thing. Um, And so I, you know, I feel a certain amount of activism to, you know, well, certainly doing this podcast is is an, is a, is an act of activism, right? Mm -hmm. And, and not everybody has the same level of, not everybody has the same gifts. We all, we all come with different gifts. Not everybody has the same desire to march in the street or Mm -hmm. do a do a crazy podcast or whatever right (laughs) Mm -hmm. but some people some people want to you know write letters to the editor or some people you know feel that they can do that but there's also there's also other ways that we're being called and it can be our compassion for each other 
can we be more compassionate to one another? That's one of the things that climate change is asking us to do is, can we look at one another and say, mm, we're kind of all in this boat together. And if, if you're struggling, can I see that, that I can alleviate some of that struggle for you? Can I see my struggle in your struggle? Right. So, so the idea of compassion, I, I think we're being called to be more compassionate. We're being called to care for mother earth, care for her e e un, even in our little um, corner, whether it's regenerative agriculture in our own yard, whether it's eating organic because that, that helps the system of regenerative and less chemical the more that the more money we spend, the more we support that system, like like Gundy said, like Gundy Rhodes mm -hmm. said, the more that we support that system, the more that system is able to thrive. Yeah, and I, I uh, agree. Now I happen to have been reading or rereading uh, Charles Eisenstein's Climate A New Story today. He says this is a time we're all being called into a new relationship with the earth what to echo what you were saying about we're being called to be compassionate with our fellow humans and all our relations as indigenous people talk about the beings that we share the earth with mm -hmm. all our relations i have a quote from climate a new story healing on any level contributes to healing on every level he is talking about the fact that we are of a reductionist mindset because of science, which you and I do not want to denigrate science. That's, it's, a, it's an important part of what's gotten us to where we are, but we are, we are up against a wall, the limits, we're hitting the limits of that worldview. Mm -hmm. And he's calling us to recognize actually the interconnectedness of what he calls a recognition of our interbeing. Mm -hmm. And I think that's from Thich Nhat Han is the, the story mm -hmm. of interbeing is that yeah, we are, we are all interconnected. So what you do um, affects me and what, and what I do affects the bees and the, we're all, whatever we do is, it's, it's that butterfly effect. It's affecting everything. Um, and, and even this is going to sound really out there, but even recently, I mean, I've really had those downloads of even down to our thoughts, mm -hmm. even down to, you know, we're, we are, we are creating the world that we live in from the very bottom up based on our thoughts. Can we focus on what we want the world to look like instead of what we don't want? If we're focusing on what we don't want, we're giving energy to what we don't want. Can we, can we focus on what we do want? And I'm not saying, I'm not saying bury your head in the sand. You still need to know what's going on, but can you look at, can we hold a vision for what it looks like to live in peace? What it looks like to live in a world that all sentient beings are respected, that all people of all colors are respected, that, that mother, herself is um is respected mother earth mother earth mother earth is respected you know um there's charles get charles gets a little bit out there and i which i i'm so there too but he's talking he's talking about you know what if we actually come to the knowledge where science and spirituality are kind of are kind of coming quantum physics is kind of catching up with spirituality right and saying that if there is consciousness in everything, how will that change who, what it feels like to clear cut a forest? Will, yeah. we, will we know, will we be able to acknowledge the pain that we are causing earth to do that? When, we, when we're fracking, when we're strip mining, when we're, when we're doing these horrendous things to the earth, destroying her, and it's destroying our own, like spoiling our own nest at the same time. Mm -hmm. Like we're, we're hurting mm -hmm. her, but, but it gets mm -hmm. back to it. We're all, you know, we need water, we need air, mm -hmm. we need food. 
And uh, yeah, and I, again, I would say the indigenous world view, which is still held by indigenous people all over the world, including right where I live in, in Northern Ontario, is that there is a sacredness, there is a consciousness. And mm -hmm. I know I have a good friend, Karen, who when she hears people talking about resources, like in terms of logging, Mm -hmm. And using that terminology, she will always stop and say, like, it's not, it's, that's objective, that's objectifying it and saying it's out there, it's not connected to us. No, there, they aren't resources. You have to recognize that we're, it's part of a living ecosystem. And we have right, a relationship I, with those trees. Well, and I think that. Um, and correct me if I'm wrong, because I don't know as much about the indigenous community as you do, but I was always struck with the fact that they would give, you know, when they would be on a hunt, they would give gratitude to the animal who gave up its life yes. to feed them, right? And that does put us more sacredness back into our world versus producing cattle that they're not even free range. They're just meat farms yeah that and, would, that, and horrible conditions farms. yeah right. right and can can we acknowledge that mother earth is sentient that animals are sentient that they have feelings i don't know if you have that joaquin phoenix quote so the oscars were last night um and joaquin phoenix um i don't know if you saw his um his performance in in um the joker it was it was absolutely incredible. Mm. Um, but he, when he won last night, um, he gave a speech that really, I think, calls to all of us um, about, about the time we're living in. And, and, I'll, and I'll just read it. Great. Um, I think the greatest gift that acting has given me and many of us in this room is the opportunity to use our voice for the voiceless. I've been thinking a lot about some of these distressing issues that we are facing collectively. And I think sometimes we feel or are made to feel that we champion different causes. But for me, I see commonality. I think whether we're talking about gender inequality or racism or queer rights or indigenous rights or animal rights, we're talking about the fight against injustice. We're talking about the fight against the belief that one people, one race, one gender, one species has the right to dominate, control, use, and exploit another with impunity. We go into the natural world and plunder it of its resources. We feel entitled to artificially inseminate a cow and then steal her baby, even though her cries of anguish are unmistakable. And then he goes on to say that um, humanity can be so inventive and creative and genius. And I think when we use love and compassion as our guiding principles, we can develop and implement systems of change that are beneficial to all sentient beings and to the environment. Wow. In incredible, right? Yeah. Um, and, it's and almost actually, like he's been reading Charles Eisenstein. <laughs> <laughs> he's woke. He's woke. You know, Sorry, um, you, what he, were you going to say? Well, I just want to finish it up. He said, um, now, he admits, right, like we all do. Now, I've been a scoundrel in my life. I've been selfish. I've been cruel at times, hard to work with, and ungrateful. But so many of you have given me a second chance, and I think that's when we're at our best. Mm. When we support each other, not when we cancel each other out over past mistakes or, or present mistakes, right? But when we guide each other to, to grow for redemption, that is the best of humanity. It was just an incredible oh. speech, an incredible speech. And um, How was it from, received? I didn't watch the Oscars. I, I, it was standing ovation. I mean, people, I think people were, people were crying. I, it, it's been all over social media today. It's just reverberated everywhere. Um, and did, did he speak that extemporaneously? Was he channeling it's, that from a higher power? I, I, I don't know. Um, but he did, he, he quoted a lyric that his brother River Phoenix once wrote, 
run to the rescue with love and peace will follow. Mm. Just beautiful, just beautiful. And can we celebrate what's what's good about this lifetime? What's beautiful about this earth? What's beautiful about humanity? Um, in spite of the chaos that's going around, going on around us, climate is calling us. The Mother Earth is calling us to step in to the best of our abilities. And it's calling each and every one of us to step into yes. our, our gift. And if you think about it, um, I know several years ago I was at a meeting of people concerned about climate change and um, several of us broke down in tears in, during the discussion, and including me. I'll confess, mm -hmm. I'm a crier. And um, afterwards, this uh, lovely young couple came up to me and she told me that she hadn't been able to get out of bed for a year because of climate change and environmental grief in, mm -hmm. in general. She just mm -hmm. had a really, really hard time for months and months. Mm -hmm. And she said, and now she said, I see this. I've been able to see it as the crack where the light can come in mm -hmm. our opportunity to change things so dramatically mm -hmm. that there is hope in that because i don't know about you rose i have had an awareness for decades about the unfairness of the world and the fact that I was born into privilege and education and I always struggled with what does one do with the fact that if I'd been born across the world into an impoverished family, into an impoverished country, that my lot would have been so different and, and what do I do with that burden, really? Uh, I've always had that awareness that... Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. the responsibility responsibility and unfairness in mm -hmm. i mean fine for me but um there's a book out there because i i come from a mennonite religious background uh there's a book out there that i believe was published in the early 80s that i read in that decade called rich christians in an age of hunger wow yeah and i read it and i went <gasps> yeah that's really bad. Yeah. I've never gone to bed hungry unless I'm deliberately forcing that on myself. And I never, I read it and then I put it down and I never acted on it. But really, what does one do when the paradigm is so huge? And here, this is a paradigm shifting opportunity because everything's going to come crashing down. Well, it is. Yeah, it's coming crashing down. And, and so, so again, now that we know, now that we know, and, and like Joaquin Phoenix, I've been a scoundrel. Well, I haven't been a scoundrel, but I mean, my, my prior life before I had children, B, BC, I call it before children, <laughs> I was a buyer. I mean, I was into the consumption model. I bought goods to make profit for the company that I worked on. It was all about acquisition. You know, I, I think we said this in, in another episode where, you know, does your, does your, closet reflect your climate values. Mine certainly didn't, you know, how many pairs of shoes did I have? I had a walk-in closet. But as I've become more and more aware, I'm like, stuff doesn't make us happy. Can, can, we, can we all agree that stuff doesn't make us happy? I agree. Climate change is forcing us to look at that. It's forcing us to say, I don't need to be more, I don't need to consume more to be happy. It doesn't fill me up. That, that's a, can we just acknowledge even that much? And then when we, when we start from there, can we see how our behavior to consume, to compete versus collaborate hurts all of us, all of us. And that, and that, competitive model starts at a very, very young age, fiercely competitive. We teach our kids to be fiercely competitive. You know, um, well, I, I don't know why I'm channeling Charles tonight, but Mr. Yeah! Ice, 
<laughs> he's my favorite. So yeah, I got I'm crushing on that guy. Yeah, he's amazing. Mr. Eisenstein says that our predominant values in our culture are money and war. So if you mm -hmm. think about that, of course you're competitive mm -hmm. because you have to compete in both of those. But here's but here's the thing. Okay, so this just occurred to me as you were mm -hmm. talking about that. So when we're raising our, ch our kids, right, when they get to, um, I can remember this with, with my younger son, Connor, shout out to Connor. When he was very young and he's, and he still has an incredible, incredibly big heart. He, he's an environmental engineer. I know I've talked about him a, a bunch, but when he was very young, you know, we taught him to, it was all about sharing, right? You know, share your toys, share, um, everything was about giving. And then when he got to be about maybe five years old, we took him to play basketball on a team for the first time. And it was a complete disconnect because up to the first, for the first five years, he was all about not holding anything to himself, oh. but, but giving generously, right? Not taking the ball away. <laughs> and, and now all of a sudden it was like. He's being cheered on for taking the ball like, away. Yeah. It's like, Connor, take that grab the ball, get it away from him, <laughs> run away with the ball, you cake it, bah, 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 run away, get down the, go, 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 you know, and I'm like, and, and I remember him kind of looking at me like, who is this insane woman <laughs> who's telling me everything that she ever taught me is wrong, because it is when you start playing sports, right, it's that whole competitive thing, you know, it's like, and, and, I can remember looking at his little face and he was like looking at me in disbelief. It's like, what are you saying? And, and it's so, it's such the antithesis, but when they, when kids get to be a certain age, when they go to school, it's all about who has the best grades and who has, you know, the most stars on their paper and whether you have an A or a B or a C. I mean, it's all the whole competitive thing. And then elementary school, it's all about um, this I digress, but it's all about teaching to the test, right? So that you get to the, you can be at the highest level. And, oh, and yeah, that's and what that's what our education system is. It's 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 getting, indoctrinating to be better than the next person. So you get into the university you want. So you get into the, you know, finish that program. Oh yeah, that's yeah. So I mean, so here's so here climate change is saying no. No, it's about sharing. It's about taking what you need and not taking more than you need. That famous quote, there's enough for everyone's need, but not for one man's greed. Exactly. And then when, you know, and then you can bring, so you can bring that into looking at the people who are hoarding, the billionaires that are hoarding, the Waltons and the Jeff Bezos and the Jamie Dimons, the billionaires who are saying, we need more, we need more, but but people are hungry and fish are dying and the rivers are polluted because you need more. It's okay. So I'm just going to stop you there, Ms. Rose. And this is, this is again out of the Eisenstein playbook. <laughs> <laughs> so is it them or actually I've been listening to Byron Katie. Do you know Byron Katie's mm -hmm. work at all? Mm -hmm. I've been listening it. to her this week too. And so is it actually their greed? Or is it ours as well? I would just say, yes, we're not, we're not billionaires. We are not the head of JP Morgan Chase. But no. are they reflecting back oh, our yeah, values? No. They are reflecting our values. They so it's all a mirror, right? And the thing, and here's the thing, the thing that really, really aggravates you the most, that's what you're meant to learn about. So yeah, we live white privileged lives. Yes. I mean, I, I have can't remember the last time I wanted something that I wasn't that I you know that I really wanted for something um how lucky am I and so yeah the whole paradigm that we live in we're being asked to look at it we're being asked to look at it and to acknowledge our place in it and what we can do to make a shift and and i'm not talking about the individual shift of not using a plastic straw yeah that's part of it but it's more it's more an internal shift of can we can we walk our talk can we live our values can we be 
human? Can we be humane? And can we connect with our heart even when it's scary, even when we're stuck in fear? Can we take that big breath and walk in, turn around and, and walk towards our fear rather than running away from it? Mm-hmm. Because that is what we're conditioned to do. And this is what climate change has called me to do, is to look at my fear. And I was so fearful. And now that I've looked at climate change straight in the face, there's not a lot that scares me, I have to say, because that was the scariest thing for me. And once I I did that, I'm not saying that I'm never scared. Sometimes I'm scared in traffic when my husband's driving too fast. (laughs) (laughs) But, you know, on a real existential level, turning around and facing my fear released me and released so much energy in my life that I did not know was constricted, was, was bound up with that fear. And once, mm-hmm. we, once we release it, then it's, we can access it. We can. Well, it's, it becomes fuel for purpose. Yeah. So. It's asking us to step out of our comfort zone, out of what we've known. That's for sure. Out of what we've known and what we've been taught is correct. It's asking us to use critical thinking skills. It's asking us to, to access our hearts because, our, because we, our bodies know, our hearts know. We can rationalize all we want, but you get that pit in your stomach and you're like, oh, this doesn't feel right. Yes. If it doesn't feel right, pay attention to it. Mm. Mm-hmm. So do we have any good news? Well, the good news is um, this week, I mean, I think Georgetown is a, just a huge, huge thing. And I know that, um, that you read this week um, on Monday, you read the best in, of her best in climate um, about, the, the, about the big, sh- what is it, the big shift that's happening. Or, um, but Georgetown University has, um, has stepped in and um, divested. And that, I mean, that has so many repercussions because of um, the level that they operate at, the alumni that they have, the money that they have, that they hold. Um, but they hold, they have a lot of clout. In other words, you're they saying do. they, they, yeah. They have so much clout and they have, they're, they're revered. And so they, they inspire. And if they don't inspire, perhaps they shame others for not stepping in. So, you know, one by one, I mean, we're starting to, we're starting to see it happen. Well, that definitely counts as good news. That is good news. So our action step and our sanity tip are wrapped up. I think that's the third week in a row I've managed to do this. Woo! <laughs> It is to take a look at Charles Eisenstein, because of course, he's come up a few times in this podcast, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, but he's just launched a multimedia series called Climate Inside and Out, a multimedia journey to authentic hope, a transformed relationship to a living earth. Amazing. Yes. And so the action step is to go onto that uh, website, which we will post, mm-hmm. and then to watch at least one video. The first one's only two and a half minutes and see if that uh, doesn't both inspire you and make you hopeful and make you want to listen to some of the rest of them. Yeah. Well, he's asking us to look at climate in a different way. And I think maybe that's kind of what we're, we're doing in this podcast too, is can you see the bigger picture? Can you, can you acknowledge that, yes, this is happening, but it's happening on such a different level and it's happening in a way that if we tune into it, we can be glorious. It's, it, it can be a glorious time. If we can let go of the fear of the unknown Mm-hmm. Let go of the fear and the despair, which is connected to the, the fear. Because some people mm-hmm. go right from fear to despair. They, they just don't even ever get to hope. And there is hope. Yeah, there's, a, there's an authentic hope. 
that's not denying the magnitude of the crisis, but there's an authentic hope that's there. And can we step into that? Can we step into that with the gifts that we were born to share? And on that profound note, <laughs> that's a wrap. Okay. Thanks for listening. That's this week's episode of Earth Feels. Special thanks to singer-songwriter Kristen Hoffman for generously allowing us to use song for the ocean. Thanks for listening. Don't forget, subscribe to our podcast so you don't miss an episode. Catch you next time. Bye-bye. Children of the earth, I'm calling out. There's a mission for you and for me. You see, our mother, she has been suffering. And the truth is told beneath the sea So raise your voices